Um, so thank you very much for inviting me here. I have uh, I have sort of a funny history with meetings like this. I was the last time I was in a workshop like this was in Karlsruhe, and I was actually talking about our work with automating puppetry. And uh, basically, I was talking about an eight-year project that we'd spent a lot of time on. We'd learned a ton from it, and it never worked. And I was trying to explain to my various colleagues in the audience why I had spent eight years on something that never worked. Um, and in doing so, I found myself saying, you know, one of the really interesting things about puppets is that their only purpose in mechanical motion is to communicate. That they, they, they don't act on the world, they're not tools, they don't, they don't change the world physically. Instead, all of their motion, the only thing that it's intended to do is to communicate. And even though I don't think that really stuck with anyone else, I, having just said it, it really stuck with me. <laughs> um, and I started thinking more about drawing as maybe a uh, setting where robots are communicating, at least in some sense, through physical motion. There's an artifact at the end of that communication attempt. And this is, this is in, a, in a setting where what we want at least as roboticists, as a roboticist, one of the things that I want is I, I want to understand the principles by, principles by which we can understand what it is robots do and the principles by which we can make them do things that we want them to do. Now, most of what robots do end up being driven by position and notions of error. We really want robots to be able to move to a particular location at a particular time, they grab things, they maybe move to a particular location in space. And what that means implicitly is that we really take the idea of error as a metric in motion very, very seriously. In fact, one has to look very, very hard at all of the ICRA papers presented at this meeting to find you know, more than a handful of papers where error is not the fundamental metric by which success is measured possibly combined with something that goes, that's along the lines of metabolic efficiency, right? And so between error and energy, you've sort of captured almost everything that's what we care about. And um, that's largely because, you know, robots, they have terrible actuators, noisy sensors, they're slow and unreliable, they're in uncertain uh, conditions, and yet they still manage to do things, and we're excited about the fact that they do things. Um, and so in a way, you know, you can kind of understand why people have not yet looked for other principles by which we can understand uh, robot behavior. Nevertheless, I'm interested in looking at um, why robot drawing is as compelling as it is. So there's really amazing examples. So this is work from Hod Lipson's group. Um, he uses, th the narrative here essentially is something like artificial intelligence or machine learning is creating art and his robot paints these beautiful paintings based on the image that you see here on the right. Um, here's another example of a robot that uses edge detection and image binarization to generate sketches as well. Uh, as many of you have just recently seen, this was actually already in the talk before I realized that I would be in the uh, in the room with fame, um, we, we have sketching robots that can uh, really produce quite beautiful images. Now, in all of these cases, there are potentially very sophisticated algorithms, right? And, and, and sophisticated not necessarily in a good way, right? Because much like when we were first figuring out how to wrap feedback loops around amplifiers and speakers, and much like when we were first figuring out how to communicate across, communicate across telegraph wires, there's a lot of sort of ad hoc reverse engineering going on of understanding what the relationship is between the task and the way in which you're going to automate that task. And so here you see some block diagrams of um, the various different pieces that needed to be programmed in to make these drawing algorithms work. And actually what I'm gonna be talking about is the one on the right. I'm gonna be showing you images from my group's work where the block diagram is this single pipeline. There's like nothing sophisticated about it. There's no learning going on. There's no, like there's, there's nothing, nothing that you would even remotely characterize as being artificial intelligence. This is, our approach to drawing is like the cruise control of drawing. Right, like, you know, it is like the simplest, most boneheaded way imaginable of thinking about what the robot is doing and how that enables 
drawing as a consequence of motion. Okay, and then another thing that I want to point out is that um, drawing is something that happens in time. Like it's an intrinsically time-connected activity. As you're watching this, think about how, how long does it take you to start to have a mental picture of what it is that you're looking at that's being drawn. And at some point, typically around here, people are pr pretty sure it's a face. How many people actually already know who this is? Yeah, it's Abraham Lincoln. Um, it's amazing to me when I show this to people, people will identify Abraham Lincoln early in this process, like right? almost right when the brow has been, a line has gone across the brow, they know it's Abraham Lincoln. And what's interesting to me about that is that that means that in time, information, like the robot is an expressive unit, and every moment that it's moving under this algorithm, it's adding information to the viewer about what the subject is. And this is the original image. And what you see on the right are uh, 50 different drawings of the same image, all from different sort of initial conditions. And, and they, they look remarkably similar to each other. What this means is that the Abraham Lincoln's face rendered to this degree is an invariant. It's a dynamic invariant of the algorithm that no matter how it starts, it will always end up with roughly the same image. And that's interesting because this is now completely incompatible with our notion of error, or at least error in time, as a way of characterizing robot motion. Because every one of these trajectories, every one of these executions of how the robot moves in time, they're all completely different, and yet they're all fundamentally accomplishing the same task. One of the things that we get from studying the, com the intersection of art and robots is that this is a, a way of characterizing what robots should be capable of, that my claim is that the sort of classical narration of what robots are about just doesn't, even, doesn't have the richness to express this as an idea. That, um, in, in fact, I, I also had a, an interesting interaction with Rodney Brooks. I, um, so I posted a video when we were doing this experiment at a museum. Um, and I posted a video of it. And because it's a Rethink robot doing it, I, I, I tagged Rethink in it. And immediately, Rodney says, uh, so what I think is important about this is that we made the force control open source. <laughs> that, was his, that was his response to the tweet, um, which was great, except that there's no force control in this experiment. I didn't have the heart to tell him that. Um, but it, it, you know, it's interesting, because this robot is busy. It, so it's, it's, it's using a piece of glass, uh, something called a light board, and it's marking on the light board marking on the light board. And, um, and as, it, as it works, typically there's sort of a sweet spot where people feel like it most looks like Abraham Lincoln, and then it essentially ends up overworking the image, right? It can actually go too far. And this, this is uh, partially really, like right about here, starting to just fill in. There's too many dots. You can't really tell what's going on. Like the abstraction has started to fall apart. But algorithmically, the way that we do this is we take the original image, we decompose it using Fourier transform, and then we generate a trajectory that is what is called ergodic with respect to the image. So the image itself is a policy for motion for purpose of drawing. And that's, in fact, all that's going on here. Um, it happens every instant in time. It recomputes how well it has added some information about the original image. And in principle, mathematically, if you allowed this to go on forever, it would perfectly reconstruct all of the information about the original image. You'd be able to get a perfect reconstruction. We can also do this, interestingly, with uh, letters. And I think letters are really in are fascinating because um, you can, of course, take the letter... I'm from Northwestern, so we have to use the letter N. Um, but you can take the letter N, and one interpretation of the letter N is that you fill it in, right? You sort of generate, fill in all that volume. But yet another interpretation is this N on the right, which is actually awfully similar to uh, the N that we might write in script. Um, part of what I think is interesting about that is that really the main difference between the ends in the middle and the end on the right is that the end on the right is time constrained, 
that it just does, it, you know, we're not giving it unlimited time to draw the end. It has just a very short amount of time to draw the end, and it ends up with something that looks a lot like script. Okay, so the basic idea here is that we have, we have an original image. We have uh, the Fourier transform, the most standard mathematical uh, technique probably for 150 years. And, um, and then we use that to drive motion of the robot. We looked at a bunch of cases. And something that I think is interesting here is, so what you see on the left are the original images. What you see in the middle are um, approaches from other people's groups, essentially, and then what you see on the right are our algorithms approaching the same problem. And so the, the approaches are clearly not the same as each other, right? Like, they aren't producing the same image, and I'm going to talk a little bit about that in a moment, but they are producing images that are qualitatively similar to each other and um, have, the, have similar levels of characterization of the original image. Here you can see quite clearly the role of the, um, of the transform. So on the left, you see both the image and the Fourier transform of the image. And in the middle, you see the renderings of that image and the Fourier transforms of those renderings. And indeed, the renderings give a very good likeness. Like if you were to compare the transforms at the bottom and the two middle ones to the one on the left, they're doing a pretty good job of capturing the same information about the image. And then on the right, you see the one that we get, which is frankly, not quite as good. Um, but at the information level, it's capturing much of the same image that we see in the, le in the far left panel. OK, so th th the fact that these, that the fact that drawing is something that even though at the end we have a static object, it's really evolving in time, I think is sort of a deep point, because robots doing this always constrained to act in time. We are as well, right? Like animals, robots, whatever. Time, whether they have to explicitly reason about it or not, time is always a piece of how they have to reason about the world in terms of making decisions. Decisions happen sequentially. And in each of these images, so all of these images are using the same algorithm to do the drawing, but in each of them, the, the rate at which you potentially ident identify the object that you're looking at happens at a different rate, right? It's, it, some of the things are immediately obvious what they are. Typically, people can identify the, the Eiffel Tower in the upper left in the first few strokes of motion. Uh, the Taj Mahal, I think partially because many of us are less familiar with it, it takes longer for it to pop out what it is. And then um, the upper right and middle bottom, th those are both uh, from the same image of Albert Einstein. But actually, it's because they're from the same image. One is just the head cropped, and the other is the full uh, headshot, including shoulders. And because they're the same image, people will spend a lot of time being confused about which one it is and who it is. Is one of them Mark Twain? You know, um, they'll spend a lot of time pondering that. But to me, what this says is that in all of these instances, the robot itself is acting as a communication channel. That the robot is fundamentally a physically constrained entity. It, it is transferring information from something that it acted as a witness to something that it's now generating a sort of testimony about. Actually, I think in the interest of time, I will. OK, so, so this is a slide that I think in, in this room might be among the most interesting. So these are all images of Abraham Lincoln. Um, the columns on the left are three different algorithms that are basically implementing this information channel approach. They're assuming that the goal is to communicate as much information as possible. Um, and then the top row assumes that you get to kinematically move the robot. The bottom one assumes that there are dynamics. Basically, it assumes that the robot has mass. And so when you, you have to accelerate and decelerate the mass as you move. Um, and, you know, all of these images are quite different from each other. The algorithm that is generating the image is exactly the same, but you're seeing the consequence of physics, right? In the same way that we know that when we pick up a cell phone, as we go from 3G to 4G and the fundamental physics of transmitting information are being exploited in different ways, 
Here we're seeing you know, two different robots that have different physical characteristics actually end up rendering very, very different images when they draw. Uh, the algorithm on the right, that's the same one that gave that nice, efficient rendering of an N. I'm, um, here, it's trying. <laughs> right, like this is not something that, on the right-hand column, this is, of course, not identifiable as Abraham Lincoln, but it was fundamentally time-constrained. It just didn't have enough time to generate a good rendering. And then on the, on the right, this is actually my favorite image of Abraham Lincoln. Does anyone have a guess what the assumption was in generating this image on the right? So this is, this is a different physical assumption about what the robot's capable of doing. So we gave, the, we gave the robot a virtual sort of paintbrush, something that the way it would stencil, once it excited it, it had its own mass. And so once excited, you can't damp it out. And so the robot had to take into account that there was this constant wobbling, right, that it couldn't, that it couldn't stop, couldn't get rid of. And so, what you, so it had to figure out, sort of like a kid does, like just squiggle. How do I squiggle and squiggle enough that I can fill in something? And in that regard, we could never get it to do the other eye. <laughs> but in that regard, it did a pretty decent job. Like if you, if you compare the images, it's working with what it has. And again, really what we're seeing here is that as a communication channel, the physics of the robot is simply less appropriate. The physics of the robot is a less embodied capable agent for doing this kind of a drawing. Okay, so, you know, there are multiple approaches to creating algorithms that um, allow one to draw. And many of those have lots of different pieces that have been handcrafted, and those handcrafted choices in the algorithmic structure allow one more and more versatility, oftentimes based on intuition, about how to create different types of effects in the drawings. But I think it's, it's interesting that the other thing that we get from looking at drawing robots is a new principle of understanding motion, that understanding the robot as technically, literally, a communication channel that is as much as possible transferring information about the image that it sees to the thing that it's trying to draw. That's a very, very clean representation of what the robot's purpose is and how it is enacting that purpose. Much like in the history of understanding animal motion, energy played a fundamental role, like measuring metabolic energy as a way of understanding why animals move the way they move. Um, we now use these ideas where even when we are using a robot, and even when we're using a robot that is, that is mechanically coupled to a person, we find that this idea of information transfer about a task often does a better job at capturing success and quality of motion than error or uh, ener energetic efficiency does. And so in that regard, drawing sort of enabled what I think is a relatively crucial step in, in adding to the, the sets of ways that we understand robot motion and, and think about how to create robot motion. Okay, so um, thanks, thanks for listening. I think if you take anything home from this, I think, or I hope that uh, you'll think about robots as being physically embodied communication channels that, as Amy was saying just a moment ago, w the ways in which they are capable of being expressive are things that we should take seriously, in, but not just in terms of the way that we ask them to do the arts, but actually in all automation. Every time we learn something new from looking at robots in the context of the arts, we're also adding to what the robots can potentially do in any automation uh, setting. So with that, thank you very much.